I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Well, uh, what are we doing here? We're uh, still continuing the onslaught of Halloween stories, uh, all coming from a book I've been reading called The Haunted Looking Glass, Ghost Stories Chosen by Edward Gorey. So he just kind of pulled together a bunch of public domain stories and drew pictures for him and sold a book about it. But I like Edward Gorey, so it doesn't bother me. Uh, New things with me? Uh, If you're looking for scary things involving Halloween, I decided to shave my face. Uh, get rid of the mustache, the beard, the whole works. Uh, and I don't know why. I've been sort of growing my cheap and crappy version of facial hair all through COVID. And I just thought, ah, I'll get rid of it. Uh, see what it's like to shave the whole face. So I did. My first thought was, oh, the skin where the hair was actually looks smoother, younger. Uh, and the skin above it and around it uh, looks like crap. It's all wrinkled and sunburned looking. Because I'm old. and It's just normal. But once I got past the initial, hey, look at me, I'm 20 years old again, face, then I started to notice all the kind of weird slopey folds and the disgusting softness and tackiness of the freshly shaven skin. Kind of like as if you molded the bottom half of my face out of silly putty. That's kind of what it looks like. So that's been bothering me. I kind of had a mustache going for a while today, uh, but it looked like a like a pervert's mustache, not like a real mustache. Not even like my I played uh, games online with a group of friends that we do every once in a while, and uh, just got done doing that. And uh, yeah, uh, one of my friends kept saying, I, don't know, "I can't tell if you look like you should be a cop or you should own a van that doesn't have windows." So uh, he makes a good point. And I thought, yeah, this has been bothering me. It just looks too weird. So I got rid of that, and now my face really looks gross. Like some sort of deep sea creature that hasn't seen light its whole life. And now suddenly there it is, my skin, pulsing with veins underneath it. It's disturbing. Went over to my dad's house. Uh, He gave me a printer, which is useful for my kids in school. Because I don't ever want a printer. I don't have a reason for it. But, uh... But the kids every once in a while will say, oh, I gotta print this thing up for school. And then they have to like sign it or something and whatever. And I'll say, well, it looks like we're going to the UPS store to pay the 25 cents to get it printed. Because uh, it doesn't happen often enough where it's worth buying a printer. But my dad gave me an extra one that he had. So, that's uh, something I'll be playing with. Eh, nothing spooky or Halloween-y about that. Uh, president's still terrifying. He, uh... Apparently the Michigan governor that almost got abducted and held for ransom by a group that planned on blowing up bridges to prevent the police from chasing him, uh, she apparently Trump doesn't like her, and even though that nearly happened to her, he, he doesn't seem to care. So I guess he made some public statements about how she should be locked up. It, it's, it's amazing. I'm exhausted. I just wish I could like go out and uh, have a beer and a burger again. Man, those were good days. All right, well, that's enough rambling. With that, let's get into our story. Well, this week's author is uh, L.P. Hartley. Um, He's uh, Leslie Poles Hartley. Born on the 30th of December, 1895, and died on the 13th of December, 1972, a year before I was born. Uh, He was a British novelist and a short story writer, although his first fiction was published in 1924, uh, his career was slow to take off. His best-known novels are the Eustace 
and Hilda trilogy from 1944 to 1947, and The Go-Between in 1953. The latter was made into a film in 1971, as was his 1957 novel, uh, The Hireling, in 1973. He was known for writing about social codes, uh, moral responsibility, and family relationships. Sounds fun. In total, Hartley published 17 novels, six volumes of short stories, and a book of criticism. Did you know that he's got conflicts with res- the, none other than Virginia Woolf and uh, Cynthia Asquith? Uh, though Hartley uh, joined the Chelsea Literary Group, the Bloomsbury Group was also prominent in England at the time. Uh, though the Bloomsbury Circle was more popular, Hartley had no interest in joining them. Yeah, he expressed his distaste for Virginia Woolf after her novel The Waves was published, uh, asking the leader of the Bloomsbury Group, Raven Mortimer, uh, what, are the, what are the wild waves saying? And on another occasion, Woolf asked Hartley, Have you written any more shabby books, Mr. Hartley? Uh, particularly referring to Quote, the one that might have been written by a man with one foot in England and the other in Venice. Is that the name of the book or something she said? As she advised him to change his former way of writing, uh, Cynthia Asquith was a supporter through much of Hartley's career, publishing some of his earliest writings in her anthologies and welcoming him into her social circles. However, feelings started to change after Hartley did not allow her to publish his novel, The Go-Between. Uh, Asquith reminded him of this fact, Often, and Hartley came to believe that the only reason she continued to be friends with him was his increased popularity. Oh, at one point, Asquith convinced Hartley's cook to leave him and work for her. Nah. On another occasion, uh, she gave him vinegar instead of alcohol. So there's that. Uh, just pettiness all around. You always hear about that with these writers, uh, that they always would make fun of each other in their books. And... Uh, Man, that must have been really annoying. I would hate to be a writer back in those days. Well, with that, let's get on to our story. A Visitor from Down Under by L.P. Hartley. Uh, A little quote at the top. And who will you send to fetch him away? Question mark. Ooh, that seems intimidating. After a promising start, the March day had ended eh, in a wet evening. Oh, it's hard to tell where the rain or fog predominated. Uh, the loquacious uh, bus conductor said, A foggy evening to those who rode inside, and uh, a wet evening to such as were obliged to ride outside. But in or on the buses, cheerfulness held the field, uh, for their patrons, inured to discomfort, made light of climactic inclemency. Oh, Lord. All the same, the weather was worth remarking on, and most scrupulous conversationalists would refer to it without feeling self-convicted of banality. How much more the conductor, who, in common with most of his kind, had a considerable conversational gift. The bus was making its last journey through the heart of London before turning in for the night. Inside, it was only half full. Outside... As the conductor was aware by virtue of his sixth sense, there still remained a passenger, too hardy or too lazy to seek shelter. And now the bus rattled rapidly down the strand. Footsteps of this person could be heard shuffling and creaking upon metal shod stairs. Uh, Anyone on top? Asked the conductor, addressing an errant umbrella point and the hem of a Macintosh. Yeah, I didn't notice anyone, the man replied. It's not that I uh, don't trust you, remarked the conductor pleasantly, giving his hand in a lighting fare. Uh, But I think I'll go up and uh, make sure. Moments like these, moments of mistrust and the infallibility of his observation, occasionally visited the conductor. uh, They came at the end of a tiring day, and if he could uh, withstood them, there were signs of weakness, he thought, and to give way to them matter uh, for self-reproach. "'Going balmy, that's what you are,' he told himself as he casually took a fare inside to prevent his mind from dwelling on the unvisited outside, Uh, but his unreasoning disquietude. Oh, my Lord. When you see the word disquietude (laughs) in writing, then you know it's uh, overwritten. Uh, "'Survived this distraction, and murmuring against himself, he started to climb the stairs. "'To his surprise, almost stupefaction, uh, he found that his misgivings were justified. Breasting the ascent, he saw a passenger sitting on the right-hand front seat. 
and the passenger, in spite of his hat, uh, turned down, his collar turned up, and the creased white muffler that showed between the two must have heard him coming, for though the man was looking straight ahead in his outstretched left hand, wedged between his fist and second fingers, he held a coin. Hey, jolly evening, don't you think? Asked the conductor, who wanted to say something. The passenger, oh, made no reply, but the penny, for such as it was, slipped the fraction of an inch lower in the groove between the pale, freckled fingers. Yeah, I said it's a, it's a damn wet night, the conductor persisted irritably, annoyed by the man's reserve. Still no reply. Where are you for? asked the conductor in a tone suggesting that whatever it was, it must be a discreditable destination. Carrick Street. Where? the conductor demanded. Uh, He had heard all right, but slight peculiarity in the passenger's pronunciation made it appear reasonable to him, the possibility uh, humiliating to the passenger that he should not have heard. Carrick Street. Uh, Why didn't you say Carrick Street? the conductor grumbled as he punched the ticket. There was a moment's pause, then Carrick Street, the passenger repeated. Yes, I know, I know, you didn't go on telling me, fumed the conductor, fumbling with the passenger's penny. Uh, He couldn't get a hold of it from above, it slipped too far. Uh, So he passed his hand underneath the others and drew the coin from between his fingers. It was cold, even where it had been held. No, said the stranger suddenly, what do you know? The conductor was trying to draw his fare's attention to the ticket, but could not make him look around. I suppose I know you're a a clever chap, he remarked. Uh, Look here now, where do you want this ticket? In your buttonhole? Uh, Put it here, said the passenger. Where? said the conductor. Uh, You had a blooming letter rack. Where the penny was, replied the passenger. Uh, Between my fingers. Yeah, the conductor felt reluctant. He didn't know why to oblige a passenger like this. The rigidity of the hand disconcerted him. Oh, it was stiff, he supposed, perhaps paralyzed. And since he had been standing on top of his own hands, with none too warm, uh, the ticket doubled up and grew limp under his repeated efforts to push it in. He bent lower for his good-hearted fellow, and using both hands, one above, uh, one below, he slid the ticket into its bony slot. Uh, right you are, Kaiser Bill. Perhaps the passenger resented this jocular illusion. Uh, oh boy. I'm turning two pages at a time. Uh, to his physical infirmity. Perhaps he merely wanted to be quiet. All he said was, uh, Don't speak to me again. Speak to you, shouted the conductor, losing all self-control. Catch me speaking to a stuffed dummy! Exclamation point. Muttering to himself, he withdrew into the bowels of the bus. At the corner of Carrick Street, quite a number of people got on board. All wanted to be first. The pride of place was shared by three women, ah, who all tried to enter simultaneously. Ah, ah, ah. The conductor's voice made itself audible above the din. Now then, now then, uh, look where you're shoving. This isn't a bargain sale. Uh, Gently, please, lady. He's only a poor old man. In a moment or two, uh, confusion abated, and the conductor, his hand on the corner of the bell, uh, bethought himself of the passenger at the top, whose destination Carrick Street was. Hey, he forgot to uh, get down. Yielding to his good nature, the conductor was averse from further conversation uh, with his uncommunicative fare, and he mounted the stairs, put his head over the top, and shouted, Carrick Street! Uh, Car- uh, Carrick Street! That was the utmost he could bring himself to do, but his admiration was without effect. His summons remained unanswered. Yeah, nobody came. Well, if he wants to stay up there, he can, muttered the conductor, still aggrieved. No, I won't fetch him down, cripple or no cripple. Oh, the bus moved on. He slipped by me, thought the conductor, while all the uh, cup-tie crowd was getting in. The same evening, uh, some five hours earlier, a taxi turned into Carrick Street and pulled up the door of a small hotel. The the street was empty. Yeah, it looked like like a cul de sac. But in reality, it was pierced by a far end of an alley, like a like a thin sleeve, which wound its way into Soho. Eh, uh, that the last, sir? inquired the driver, after several transits between the cab and the hotel. Uh, how many does that make? Uh, nine packages in all, sir. Uh, could you get all your worldly goods into nine packages, driver? Oh, that I could, into two. Well, I'll look inside and see if I have left anything. The cabman felt about among the cushions. Uh, can't find nothing, sir. What do you do with anything you find? asked the stranger. 
I take it to New Scotland Yard, sir, the driver promptly replied. Scotland Yard, said the stranger. Strike a match, will you? Uh, let me have a look. But he, too, found nothing and, reassured, followed his luggage into the hotel. A chorus of welcome and congratulations uh, greeted him. Uh, the manager, uh, manager's wife, ministers without portfolio, of whom all hotels are full, the porters, the lift men, all clustered around him. Well, Mr. Rumble, after all these years, we thought you'd, we thought you'd forgotten us. And it, wasn't it odd, the very night your telegram came from Australia, uh, we've been talking about you. And my husband said, oh, don't worry about Mr. Rumbold. Uh, he'll fall on his own feet, all right. Some fine day, he'll walk in here a rich man. Not that you weren't always well off, but my husband meant a millionaire. He was quite right, said Mr. Rumbold, slowly savoring his words. I am. There, what did I tell you? The manager exclaimed, as though one recital of his prophecy was not enough. Uh, but I wonder, uh, were you not too grand to come to Russell's hotel? I've nowhere else to go, said the millionaire shortly. And if I had, I wouldn't. This place is like home to me. His eyes softened as they scanned the familiar surroundings. They were light gray eyes, uh, very pale, and seeming paler from their setting in in his tanned face. His cheeks uh, his cheeks were slightly sunken, uh, very deeply lined, and his blunt-ended nose was straight. He had a thin, straggling mustache, and straw-colored, which made his age difficult to guess. Perhaps he was nearly fifty... He's so wasted it was the skin on his neck, his movements unexpectedly agile and decided. Uh, they, were, they were those of a younger man. I walk out to my room now, he said in response to the manageress, manageress's question. Ask Clutsum. Uh, he's, he's still with you? Good. To unpack my things, he'll find all I want for the night in the, in the green suitcase. And I'll take my dispatch box with me. And tell him to bring me a sherry. I'm bitters in the lounge. As crow flies, it was not far to the lounge, but by the way of the torturous, ill-let passages doubling on themselves, yawning with dark entries, plunging into the kitchen stairs, the catacombs so dear to habitues. Habitu I don't I don't have my Kindle, so I can't find I'm not gonna stop and look it up on the computer. Of Russell's hotel, it was a considerable distance. Anyone posted in the shadow of these alcoves or arriving at the head of the basement staircase could not have failed to notice an air of utter content which marked Mr. Rumble's leisurely progress. Oh the droop of his shoulders, acquiescing in weariness, his hands turned inwards and, and swaying slightly, yeah, but forgotten by the owner, the chin always prominent, and not pushed forward so far that it it looked relaxed and helpless, not at all defiant. The unseen witness would have envied Mr. Rumsbold, uh, perhaps even uh, grudged him his holiday air, uh, his untroubled acceptance of the present and the future. A waiter whose face uh, he didn't remember brought him the aperitif, mm -hmm, in which he drank slowly, his feet propped unconventionally upon a ledge of a uh, chimney piece, the pardonable relaxation for the room was empty. Judge, therefore, of his surprise when, out of the fire, engendered a drowsiness, he heard a voice which seemed to come from the wall above his head, a cultivated voice, perhaps too cultivated, uh, too uh, uh, slightly husky, yet careful and precise in its enunciation. Even while his eyes searched, the room to make sure that no one had come in. He could not help hearing everything the voice said. It seemed to be uh, talking to him. A rather oracular utterance implied a less restricted audience. It was the utterance of a man who was aware that, though it was a duty for him to speak, uh, for Mr. Rumsbold, Rumsbold to listen, would be both a pleasure and a profit. Dot, dot, dot. A children's party, the voice announced at even a neutral tone. Nicely balanced uh, between approval uh, and distaste, between enthusiasm and boredom. Uh, six little girls. Six little, a faint life in the voice, expressive of tolerant surprise. Boys. The broadcasting company has invited them to tea, and they're uh, anxious that you should share some of, the, some of the fun. At the last word, the voice became completely colorless. And I tell you uh, that they have had tea and enjoyed it, didn't you, children? A cry of yes, muffled and timid, greeted his leading question. We should have liked you to hear our table talk, but there wasn't much of it, so we were so busy eating. And for a moment, the voice identified itself with the children. Uh, but we can tell uh, you what we ate. Now, Percy, tell us what you had. A piping voice, 
recited a long list of uh, comestibles. Now looking it up, like the children, it's basically food. Like the children in the treacle well uh, thought rum's bold, Percy must have been or soon would be very ill. A few others volunteered the items of their repast. Uh, so you see, said the voice, we have not done so badly. And now we are going to have uh, crackers. And afterwards, the voice hesitated and seemed to dissociate itself with the words, children's games. There was an impressive pause, broken by the muttered exhortation of a little girl. And don't cry, Philip. It won't hurt you. Fugitive sparks and snaps uh, of sound followed. More like the fire being mended, thought Rums bold, than crackers. A murmur of voices pierced the full sade, full of sade, f- full of sade. Not going to get that one. What do you got, Alec? Uh, what do you got in italics? Oh, I, I got a cannon. Uh, give it to me. No. Uh, lend it to me. What do you want it for? I want to shoot Jimmy. Mr. Rumsfold started. Something had disturbed him. Was it his imagination? Or did he hear above the confused medley of sound a tiny click? Oh, the voice is speaking again. But now we're going to begin the games. As though to make amends for past lukewarmness, a faint flush of anticipation gave color to the decorous voice. We will commence with that old favorite, uh, Ring a Ring of Rosies. Let's ring around the Rosies. I'm drinking coffee, by the way, at uh, 11.40 at night. So I probably won't get any sleep. The children were clearly shy and left each other to do the singing. Now their courage lasted for a time or two, and then uh, gave out. But fortified by the speaker's baritone, powerful though subdued, they took heart and soon were singing without assistance or direction. Their light, wavering voices had a charming effect. Uh, tears stood in Rumbold's eyes. Oranges and lemons came next. A more difficult game, it yielded several unrehearsed effects before it finally got underway. One could almost see the children being marshaled into the places, as though for a figure in the Lancers. Some of them, no doubt, wanted to play another game. Children are contrary, and the dramatic side of oranges and lemons, uh, though it appeals to many, always affrights a few. The disinclination of the last would account for the pauses and hesitations which irritated Mr. Rumsbold, who as a child had always had a strong fancy for this particular game. When, to the tramping uh, and stamping of many small feet, the droning chant began and leaned back and closed his eyes in ecstasy. He listened intently for the final uh, accelerando, which leads up to the the catastrophe. Still, the prologue uh, maundered on, Maundered on. Yeah, I said that one right. As though the children were anxious to extend the period of security. The joyous, carefree pomenade, uh, which the bell, the great bell of bow, was in considerate profession of ignorance. So rudely to curtail, the bells of Old Bailey pressed their assurer's question. Uh, the bells of Old Shoreditch answered uh, with becoming flippancy. The bells of Stipty posed with their ironical query, and suddenly before the great bell of Bo had time to get his word on, uh, Mr. Rumbold's feelings underwent a strange revolution. Why couldn't the game continue? All sweetness and sunshine, question mark, why drag the fatal issue, question mark, let payment be deferred. Let the bells go on chiming and never strike the hour. But... Eh, heedless of Mr. Rumbold's squeamishness, the game went on. After the eating comes a reckoning. Here is a candle to light you to bed, and here comes a, a chopper to chop off your head. A chop, chop, chop. The child screamed, and there was silence. Mr. Rumbold felt quite upset. Uh, he was uh, his great relief when, after a few more half-hearted rounds of oranges and lemons, the voice announced, Here we come gathering nuts in May. At last, there was nothing sinister in that delicious, sillian scene, compromising in one splendid botanical exact- inexactitude. Ugh. All the charms of winter, spring, and autumn. Too bad I'm not familiar with any of these games they're playing, because I have no idea what's going on. Uh, all the charms of winter, spring, and autumn, with a superiority to circumstances, was implied... Uh, in the conjunction of nuts and may, exclamation point. What a defiance of cause and effect, exclamation point. What a testimony to coincidence, exclamation point. For cause and effect is against us, as witness the fate of old Bailey's debitor. Debitor. 
<laughs> but I'm having a tough time. Again, small fonts. This is a really rough for me. Uh, but coincidence is always on our side, always teaching us how to eat our cake and have it. A long arm of coincidence. Mr. Rumbold would have liked to clasp it by the hand. Meanwhile, his own hand conducted the music of revels and his foot kept the time. His pulses quickened by enjoyment and the children put more heart to their singing. The game went with a swing. The ardor rhythm of it invaded the little room where Mr. Rumsbold sat. Like heavy fumes, the waves of sound poured in. So penetrating, they ravished the sense. So sweet, they intoxicated it. So light, they fanned it into a flame. Mr. Rumbold was transported. His hearing, sharpened by the subjugation and quiescence of the other faculties, began to take in new sounds. The names, for instance, of the players who were wanted to make up each side and the champions who were to pull them over, for the listeners in the issues and struggles remained in doubt. Did Nancy Price succeed in detaching Piercy Kingham from his allegiance? Probably. Did Alec Warden prevail against Maisie Drew? It certainly is an easy win for someone. The contest lasted only a second, and a ripple of laughter greeted it. I ah, did Violet Kingham make good against Horace Gold. Mm, this was a dire encounter, punctuated by a deep, irregular panting. Mr. Rumsfeld could see, uh, in his mind's eye, ah, the two champions straining backwards and forwards across a white, motionless handkerchief, ah, their faces red and puckered with exertion. Violet or Horace, one of them had to go. Violet might be bigger than Horace, eh, but then Horace was a boy. Eh, they were evenly matched, and they had their pride to maintain. The moment when the will was broken, the body went limp and surrender. It would be like a moment of dissolution. Yes, even this game had its stark, uncomfortable side. Violet or Horace, one of them was smarting now, eh, crying perhaps, under humiliation at being fetched away. Ugh. <sighs> more coffee. The game began afresh. How long does this go on? This time there was an eager ring in the children's voices. Uh, two tried an antagonists were going to meet. It would be a battle of giants. The chant throbbed into a war cry. Who oh, will you have your nuts and may? Nuts and may, nuts and may. Who will you have ah, for your nuts and may? On a cold and frosty morning. They would have Victor Rumbold for nuts and may. Victor Rumble, Victor Rumble, from the vindictiveness in their voices that they have meant to have had his blood too. And who will you send to fetch him away? Yeah, fetch him away, fetch him away. And who you who you send to fetch him away on a cold and frosty morning? Like a clarion call, a shout of defiance came the reply. Uh, we'll send Jimmy Hagbird, Hagbird, uh, to fetch him away. Fetch him away, fetch him away. We'll send Jimmy Hagbird uh, to fetch him away on a wet and foggy evening. The variation, might be supposed, was intended to promote a contest from the realms of pretense into the world of reality. But Mr. Rumble probably did not hear that his abduction had been anodated <laughs> and that he had turned quite green and his head was lolling against the back of the chair. Any wine, sir? Uh, yes, Clutsam. A bottle of champagne. Ah, uh, very good, sir. Mr. Rumble drained the first glass at one go. Anyone coming in to dinner besides me, Clutsam? He presently inquired. Uh, not now, sir. It's nine o'clock, replied the waiter, his voice edged with reproach. Sorry, Clutsam. I didn't feel up to the mark before it didn't. Uh, so I went and I laid down. The waiter was mollified. Thought you weren't looking quite yourself, sir. No bad news, I hope. Oh, no, nothing. Just a bit tired after the journey. And uh, how did you leave Australia, sir? Inquired the waiter to accommodate Mr. Rumsbold, who seemed anxious to talk. It better weather than you have here, Mr. Rumsbold replied, uh, finishing his second glass and measuring with his eye the depleted contents of the bottle. The rain kept up a steady patter on the glass roof of the coffee room. Still a good uh, climate isn't everything. It is like a home, for instance, the waiter remarked. Oh, no, indeed. There are many parts of the world as would be a glad of a good day's rain, affirmed the waiter. Yes, yeah, certainly are, uh, Mr. Rumsbold, bold, who found the conversation sedative, sedative, 
I'm having a really tough time. What's happening to me? Am I having a stroke? Did you do much fishing when you were abroad, sir? The waiter pursued. Eh, uh, a little. Eh, uh, well, you want rain for that, declared the waiter, as one who scores a point. The fishing isn't preserved in Australia like it is here. Eh, uh, no. Then there ain't no poaching, concluded the waiter philosophically. It's every man for himself. Yes, that is the rule in Australia. Uh, not much of a rule, is it? The waiter looked up at him. Not much like a like a law, I mean. That depends on what you mean by a law. Oh, Mr. Rumsbold, sir, you know very well what I mean. I mean the police. Now, if you was to have done a man in out in Australia, uh, murdered him, I mean, well, they'd hang you for it if they caught you, wouldn't they? Mr. Rumbold teased the champagne with the butt end of his fork and drank again. Probably they would, uh, unless there was a special circumstance. In which case, you might get off. <laughs> I might. My voice really went out in a little spot there. Yeah, that's what I mean by law, pronounced the waiter. You know what the law is. You go against it, and you're punished. Of course, I don't mean you, sir, only I say you as, a, as an illustration to make my meaning clear. Yeah, quite. Quite. Whereas, if there is only what you call a rule, the waiter pursued, deftly removing the remains of Mr. Rumsbold's chicken, it might fall into the lot of any man to round you up. Uh, it might be anybody. It might be me. Uh, why should uh, why, why should you or they, asked Mr. Rumsbold, uh, want to round me up? I haven't done you any harm, or them. Oh, but we should have to, sir. Uh, why? Uh, we shouldn't rest in our beds, sir, knowing you was at large. You might do it again. Somebody will have to see to it. Uh, but supposing there was nobody, uh, sir? Supposing the murdered man hadn't any relatives or friends? Supposing he just disappeared and uh, no one ever knew that he was dead? Well, sir, said the waiter, winking portentously, in that case uh, he'd have to go to get on your track himself. He wouldn't rest in his grave, sir. No, not he. Uh, and knowing what he did... Uh, Cut some, said Mr. Rumsbold suddenly. Uh, bring me another bottle of wine. And uh, don't trouble to ice it. The waiter took the bottle from the table and held it up to the light. Yes, it's dead, sir. Dead? Yes, sir. Finished, empty, dead. Uh, you're right, Mr. Rumsbold agreed. It is quite dead. Okay. It was nearly 11 o'clock, and Mr. Rumsbold again had the lounge to himself. Cut some would be bringing his coffee presently. Yeah, too bad of fate to have him haunted uh, by these casual reminders. Too bad. His first day at home. Too, too bad, too bad, he muttered while the fire warmed the soles of his slippers. But it was an excellent champagne. Uh, he would take no harm from it. And brandy Clutsam was bringing him would, would do the rest. Clutsam, that yeah, was a good sort. Nice old-fashioned servant. Nice old-fashioned house. Warmed. By the wine, his thoughts began to pass out of his control. Your coffee, sir, said a voice at his elbow. Thank you, Clatsom, and I'm very much obliged to you, said Mr. Rumsbold. With his exaggerated civility in slight, of, uh, in slight intoxication, you are an excellent fellow. I wish there were more like you. No, oh, I hope so, too, I'm sure, said Clatsom, trying his muddle-headed way to deal with both observations at once. There don't seem many people about, Mr. Rumsbold remarked. Uh, hotel pretty full? Oh, yes, sir. All the suites are let. And the other rooms, too. We're turning people away every day. Why, only tonight a gentleman rang up. Said he would come round late on the off chance. But bless me, he'll find the birds have flown. Birds? Echoed Mr. Rumsbold. I mean, there aren't any more rooms. Uh, not for love nor money. Well, I'm sorry for them, said Mr. Rumsbold with ponderous sincerity. I'm sorry for any man, friend, or foe who has to go tramping about London on a night like this. Eh, if I had an extra bed in my room, I'd put it at his disposal. Oh, you have, sir, the waiter said. Well, of course I have. How stupid. Well, well, I'm sorry for the poor chap. I'm sorry for all the homeless ones. Eh, Clutsum, wandering on the face of the earth. I'm into that, said the waiter devoutly. And doctors and such uh, pulled out of their beds at midnight. It's a hard life. Ever thought of, about a doctor's life, Clutsam? Oh, can't say that I have, sir. Well, well, but it's hard. You can take that from me. Uh, what time shall I call you in the morning, sir? The waiter asked, seeing no reason for the conversation should ever stop. Uh, you needn't call me, Clutsam, replied Mr. Rumsbold in a sing-song voice. 
Whoop, burp. Rushing the words together as though he were excusing the waiter from addressing him by the waiter's own name. Yeah, I'll get up when I'm ready. And that'll be pretty late. Uh, comma, pretty late. Smacked his lips over his words. Nothing like a good lie, eh, Klutzum? That's right, sir. You have your sleep out, the waiter encouraged him, and you won't be disturbed. Uh, good night, Klatsum. You're an excellent fellow, and I don't care who hears me say so. <laughs> good night, sir. Uh, Mr. Rumsbold turned to his chair and lapped around him and administered his comfort. He felt at one with it. At one with the fire, the clock, the tables, all the furniture, their usefulness, and their goodness went out to meet his usefulness. His goodness met and were friends. Okay, that was confusing. Who would bind their sweet influences or restrain them in the exercise of their kind offices? No one. Certainly not a shadow from the past. No room was perfectly quiet. Street sounds reached it only as a low, continuous hum, infinitely reassuring. Ah, but Mr. Rumsbold fell asleep. He dreamed that he was a boy again, living in his old home in the country. He was possessed, in the dream, by a master passion. He must collect firewood whenever and wherever he saw it. He found himself one autumn afternoon in the wood house, and that was how the dream began. The door was partly open, emitting a little, a little light, but he could never recall how he got in. The door of the shed was littered with bits of bark and thin twigs, but with the exception of the chopping block from which he knew it could not be used, there was nowhere a log of sufficient size to make the fire. Uh, well, he thought of only being in the woodhouse alone. He stayed long enough to make a thorough search, but he could find nothing. The compulsion he knew so well descended on him, and he left the woodhouse, went into the garden. His steps took him to the foot of a high tree. We have to read all about this. Standing by itself in a tangle of long grass at some distance of the house, the tree had been lopped for half of its height and had no branches, only leafy tufts sticking out in irregular intervals. He knew uh, what he would see when he looked up into the dark foliage, and there, sure enough it was, a long dead bow, bare in patches where the bark had peeled off and crooked in the middle, uh, like, a, uh, like, a, like, a, like an elbow. He began to climb the tree, and the ascent proved easier than he expected. His body seemed no weight at all, but he was visited by a terrible oppression, which increased as he mounted. The bow did not want him. It was projecting its hostility down the trunk of the tree, and every second brought him nearer to an object which he had always dreaded, a growth, people called it. It stuck out from the trunk of the tree, huge circular swelling, thickly matted with twigs. Uh, Victor would have rather died. Then, had, then hit his head against it. By the time he reached the bow, twilight had deepened into night, and he knew that he had to do. Sit astride the bow, since there was none nearby from which he could reach it, and press his hands until it, uh, until it broke. Using his legs to get what purchase he could, he set his back against the tree and pushed with all his might downwards. Uh, to do this... He was obliged to look beneath him and saw, far below him on the ground, a white sheet spread out as though to catch him. And he knew at once that it was a shroud. Frantically, he pulled and pushed at the stiff, brittle bow. A lust to break it took hold of him. Leaning forward his whole length, he seized the bow at the elbow joint and strained it away from him. As it cracked, he toppled over, and the shroud came rushing upwards. Mr. Rumbled waked in a cold sweat. I said that weird. Waked in a cold sweat to find himself clutching the curved arm of the chair, uh, which the waiter had set as brandy. The glass had fallen over, and the spirit lay in a little pool on the leather seat. Uh, I can't let it go like that, he thought. I must get some more. A man he did not know answered the bell. Waiter! He said, bring me a brandy and soda in my room in a quarter of an hour's time. Is that all this guy's doing? Is just like drinking and falling asleep and then waking up and drinking and falling asleep? Rumble, the name is. He followed the waiter out of the room and the passage was completely dark except for a small blue gas jet uh, beneath which was huddled a cluster of candlesticks. The hotel, he remembered, maintained an old-time habit of deference towards darkness and he held the wick to the gas jet. He heard himself muddle, here's a candle uh, to light you to bed. But he recollected the ominous conclusion of the 
distinct and fuddled as he was uh, left it unspoken. Shortly after Mr. Rumbold's retirement, the doorbell of the hotel rang, the sharp peals, and no cause between them. Someone in a hurry to get in, a night porter grumbled to Clotsam, who was still on duty till midnight. I expect he's forgotten his key. He made no haste to answer the summons. He would do the forgetful fellow good to wait, teach him a lesson. So dilatory was he that by the time he reached the hall, the doorbell was tinkling again. Irritated by such an opportunity, he deliberately went back to set straight a pile of newspapers before letting his impatient devil in. To mark his indifference, he even kept behind the door while he opened it, so that his first sight of the visitor only took his back. But the limited inspection sufficed to show that the man was a stranger and not a guest in the hotel. This story is really bugging me right now. It's, uh, how many pages do I got? Two pages left. It seems like it's taking a very long time to get to any kind of point. In the long black cape, which fell almost sheer one side and on the other stuck out as though he had a basket under his arm, he looked like a crow with a broken wing. A bald-headed crow, thought the porter, for there's a patch of bare skin between the white linen thing and his hat. Good evening, sir, he said. What can I do for you? The stranger made no answer, but glided to a side table and began turning over some uh, letters with his right hand. Are you expecting a, a message? Uh, said the porter. No, the stranger replied. I want a room for the night. Uh, was you the gentleman who telephoned for a room this evening? Yes. Well, in that case, I, I was tell you that we're afraid you can't have one. The hotel's booked right up. I ain't quite sure, asked the stranger. Think again. Them's my orders, sir. It don't do me no good to think. At this moment, the porter had a curious sensation, as though some important part of him, his life maybe, had gone adrift inside him and was spinning round and round. The sensation ceased when he began to speak. I'll call the waiter, sir, he said. But before he called the waiter, appeared intent on an errand of his own. I say, I say, Bill, he began. What's the number of Mr. Rumble's room? He wants a drink taken up to him, and I forget to ask him. Uh, it's 33, said the porter unsteadily. The double room. Why, Bill, what's up? The waiter exclaimed. You look as if you've seen a ghost. Both men stared round the hall, and then back at each other. The room was empty. Oh, God, said the porter. I must have had the horrors. But he was here a moment ago. Look at this. And on the stone flags lay an icicle, an inch or two long, around which a little pool had was fast collecting. Why, Bill, cried the waiter. Yeah, how'd that get here? It's not freezing. He must have brought it, the porter said. They looked at each other in consternation, which, changed into terror at the sound of a bell, made itself heard, coming from the depths of the hotel. Clutsam's here, whispered the porter. He'll have to answer it, whoever it is. Clutsam had taken off his tie and was getting ready for bed. And what on earth could anyone want in the lounge at this hour? He pulled on his coat and went upstairs. Standing by the fire, he saw the same figure whose appearance and disappearance had so disturbed the porter. Uh, yes, sir, he said. I want you to go to Mr. Rumsbold, said the stranger, and ask him if he is prepared to put the other bed in his room at the disposal of a friend. In a few moments, Clutsam returned. Uh, Mr. Rumbold's compliments, sir. He wants to know who it is. Uh, the stranger went to the table in the center of the room. An Australian newspaper was lying there, which Clutsam had not noticed before. The aspirant to Mr. Rumbold's hospitality turned over the pages, and then with his finger, which appeared even to Clutsam, standing by the door, uh, unusually pointed, he cut out a rectangular slip about the size of a visiting card and moved away, motioned the waiter to take it. By the light of the gas jet in the passage, uh, Clutsam read uh, the excerpt. It seemed to be a kind of obituary notice, but what possible interest could it be to Mr. Rumsbold to know that the body of Mr. James uh, Hagbird had been discovered in the circumstances which suggest that he had met his death by violence? After a longer interval, Clutsam returned, looking puzzled and a little frightened. Mr. Rumbold's compliments, sir, but he knows no one of that name. And then take this message to Mr. Rumbold, said the stranger. Say, would he rather that I went up to him or that he came down to me? For the third time, Clutsam went to the stranger's bidding, and he did not, however, upon his return, 
opened the door of the smoking room, but shouted through it. Mr. Rumbold wishes you to hell, sir, uh, where you belong, and says, come up if you dare. Then he bolted. A minute later, his retreat from an underground coal cellar, he heard a shot fired. Some old instinct, danger-loving or danger-disregarding, stirred in him, and he ran up the stairs quicker than he had ever run up in his life. In the passage, he stumbled over Mr. Rumsbold's boots, and the bedroom door was ajar. Putting his head down, he rushed in. The brightly lit room was empty, but almost all the movables in it were overturned, and the bed was in a frightful mess. The pillow, with its five-fold perforation, was the first object on which Clutsam noticed bloodstains. Thenceforward, he seemed to see them everywhere, but what sickened him and kept him so long from going down to rouse the others was the sight of an icicle on the windowsill. A thin claw of ice curved like a Chinaman's nail, oh lord, with a bit of flesh sticking to it. That was the last he saw of Mr. Rumsbold. But a policeman patrolling Carrick Street noticed a man in a long black cape who seemed, by the position of his arm, to be carrying something heavy. He called out to the man and ran after him. That, though he did not seem to be moving very fast, the policeman could not overtake him. Well, I read that out loud and somehow couldn't seem to follow any of it which is amazing. Uh, what do we got here? The scenes jump around from a mysterious man on a bus who just kind of disappears. Uh, then this guy traveling from Australia, clearly he did something wrong that he's trying to hide from and thinks he's gotten away with it, like a murder. And then he, uh, he just drinks a lot, falls asleep, and then for no reason he hears children's voices uh, singing and playing games and uh, a man talking to them. That part I didn't get. Maybe someone can explain that to me uh, because it didn't seem to lead up to anything. I thought maybe it was like ghosts in the house, but it doesn't seem like it unless I missed something, and I probably did. Then the mysterious man shows up and kills him with an icicle. Why? I don't know exactly why. I read it out loud, and I don't seem to have really uh, absorbed any of it. So, there we go. There's that. Uh, was it scary? Probably. I don't know. Apparently I wasn't paying attention, I guess. Uh, was it, uh, good? I don't know. I want to say no, but apparently I didn't pay attention. So, with that, uh, can't tie it in anything I said earlier. Uh, nothing about this story involved a putty face, like I've got, or a freshly shaven, weird little baby's lower half of the head. But uh, I got a new printer. I guess that's all that really matters from this whole experience. So with that, thanks for listening, and I will uh, see you next time.